The Lord be with you. Wonderful to see you in worship on this third Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of joy. You may have encountered some blurry-eyed youth as you were arriving this morning. Our 180 youth had a lock-in at the church yesterday, and they are now on their way home to get some sleep after a fun night together. Our two online Bible classes meet on Wednesdays at noon and Thursdays at 6. Our Peace and Justice work group will be presenting a class Thursday night on renewable energy. Sally Butner and Roger Reinecker will lead that discussion. That's Thursday at 7. You can give an urgently needed gift to people who are truly in need. You can choose from nine local missions or three global missions for an ECHO gift. This Sunday, the Church in the World Committee is focusing on a nursing scholarship for a nurse in Congo where the shortage of medical personnel is acute. You can learn more about it in today's bulletin or if you'll speak with someone at the table after worship today. We express our sympathy to Jean Custon on the recent death of her mother, Ann Jacobs, longtime member. There's no word at this point on a service, but I know you'll want to remember Jean and her family in your prayers. The flowers were given to the glory of God and in memory of Jackie and Dean Gooderham by Rob Gooderham. This afternoon, the Westminster Choir will be joined by our storytellers for our annual Christmas concert. The concert is at 3, but you'll want to come early because starting at 2.30, Sue Spilecki will be playing um, Christmas music on our tower chime and that will really put you in the spirit. I hope to see you this afternoon. If you can't be here in person, you'll be able to watch it online. Today's the final day to make a gift for our Christmas boxes. And for more information about the classes, the concert, and the Christmas boxes, you can go to the online bulletin or look in the weekly word. Following worship, you're invited to go back into the meeting room through Rodney Chapel there you can get a cup of coffee and share conversation with friends. And if you um, can help putting together some of those Christmas boxes, you can get a cup of coffee and go downstairs to classroom six. They could use some help making Christmas cards this morning. They've got all the supplies down there. They want to make some nice Christmas cards and put them in those Christmas boxes. Now, Sandy King is going to tell us a little bit about one of our important winter mission projects. Oops. <coughs> it died. Oops. Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see you all. For the past six years, our Helping Hands project has collected gloves and mittens for the homeless of our community. While the collection will still take place after the first of the year, I am so grateful to be able to speak with you this morning about the project. We are a generous church. We have our hands in so many projects and we help so many in our community. From backpacks to Christmas baskets, Westminster members have stepped up to make life more comfortable and more tolerable for so many. A new pair of gloves, mittens, or a hat or scarf for someone who doesn't have them can also make life more comfortable and tolerable during winter's fierce bite. So this morning, I am asking all of you to pick up some extra gloves, mittens, or other winter accessories when you do your holiday shopping. They shouldn't be fancy or expensive. They need to be practical. In the month of January, Collection boxes will be set up inside the church entry doors and by the front desk. You'll know them by the mittens on the boxes. So please leave your donation whenever you visit the church during January. Thank you for all you do, each one of you, to show the love of God to our community. We do take much for granted. Just some warm gloves, a scarf, a hat will help so many in our community. Now we're delighted to invite Aaron and Teresa Wimhoff and their sons, Cooper and Griffin, to come forward and light our candle of joy.
Please join us in the lighting of the Advent candle. On our journey to Bethlehem, we have lit the candles for peace and hope. Today we light the candle of joy. Joy is an underground spring that wells up within us, but joy is also an approach to life. So today, we open ourselves to joy, trusting that God has already planted it within us. Please join us in the Advent prayer. Loving God, we open ourselves to you, trusting that you will guide us to joy filled lives. Show us the creative power of hope. Teach us the peace that comes from justice. Fill us with the kind of joy that cannot be contained but must be shared. Prepare our lives to be transformed so that we may.
Today's passage is a vision by the prophet Isaiah. The Hebrew people have been conquered by the Babylonians. They've been dragged away from their homes, and now they live this harsh existence in a foreign land. Their future has been all but erased, and they are absolutely consumed by despair. It's in the midst of this gloom that Isaiah has the vision of a better day. Isaiah says, The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands. Make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful heart, be strong. Do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. The lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water, the haunt of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the Holy Way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, will go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return. They will come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
When Anne was young, her father would take her hiking. One of their favorite places was a forest near their house. They would hike up this old dirt road, and then when they reached the top, they had this spectacular view. They could see the Minnesota fields and the river bluffs. It was a wonderful sight. One year in late winter, when the snow was beginning to shrink, she and her dad put on their hats and scarves and mittens and boots and headed out. He told her there was going to be a surprise at the top of the hill. When they reached the summit, he gave her a snow picnic. He built a fire, they cooked some marshmallows, then they pulled out the Hershey bars and put them on graham crackers and ate some mores. How many love those gooey chocolate messes? Yeah. The s'mores were the treat, but not the surprise. After they gobbled their sticky treat, her father led her across some rocks, and when they got to the other side of the rocks, she saw something. She saw this splash of purple. Pushing up through the snow were all these wild crocuses. It was a sign that spring was on its way. In today's passage, the prophet Isaiah shares his vision with the Hebrew people. He says, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. In Isaiah's vision, the crocus symbolizes the coming of a new day. The coming of a day for people whose spirits had been absolutely crushed. They were living in a foreign land. They had seen family members killed. Their homes had been demolished. To every reasonable person, it seemed like it was the end of their culture and the demise of their religion. They'd just be assimilated into the Babylonian culture, and that would be the end of their complete ancestry. But as Isaiah said, it's not the end. I've had a vision. As the blooming of the crocus marks the winding down of winter and the coming of spring, Isaiah envisions the bitter days of exile being replaced by the blossoming of a new season. To peek through the blinds and provide a glimpse of what's coming, the prophet employs this poetry to illustrate what he's trying to communicate. Now, lodged in the mind of every listener was the story of the Exodus. Centuries earlier, Moses had led the people out of Egypt and then led them through this terrible wilderness before they reached their destination. They knew that if they were able to liberate themselves from the clutches of the Babylonians, that on their way back home they would have to traverse this harsh, barren landscape. However, the prophet said that the day is coming that's going to be so glorious that that wilderness is going to flourish. In fact, it's going to take part in the celebration. And that's only part of the story. The weak will be mistaken for weightlifters. The fearful, they'll be like Navy SEALs. Isaiah says, be strong. Do not fear. Here is your God. The eyes of the blind are going to be opened. The ears of the deaf are going to be unstopped. The lame, they're going to leap like deer. The tongue of the speechless will sing like the Westminster Choir. <laughs> I think that's what he said. <laughs> to defeated people who could not see beyond the nightmare they were living. Isaiah divulged this dazzling dream. But can't you just hear some of the reactions 
to the prophet's enchanting vision. Did you hear Isaiah? That man is delusional. There's no reason to have any hope. Crocus schmocus, misery abounds. Never again will we see any signs of spring. The weak will become strong. The fearful, courageous, yeah, and I'm going to get wings and I'm going to fly. History proved those naysayers dead wrong. Despite the long odds, some clung to that vision of hope and they saw their dream come true. The people were liberated. They returned home. They rebuilt their lives. And of course, Isaiah's prophecy and this vision isn't just a relic from ancient times. It's a timeless message of hope because God always seeks to lead us to a better day. And hope sparks joy. In our day, if you choose to be a cynic, you can stack up plenty of evidence for despairing about the future and squelching all joy. The coronavirus has mutated again. Our political environment is as toxic as ever. We are rapidly overheating the planet. Depression and anxiety among our youth has doubled during the pandemic. Social media passes along lies that parade as truth. White supremacy groups are on the rise. The list seems to have no end. What's your darkest concern? Does it even make sense to talk of joy during times such as this? It's vital for us to remember that God does not determine the course of our lives or the events of the world. We are free to make choices. Choices that can lead us closer to God's dream or further from it. God calls us, urges us, challenges us to lean into a new future whose foundation is compassion, in beauty, in justice, in peace. God whispers of new possibilities for transforming our lives and for us making needed changes in our world. As we embrace new possibilities, it increases our hope, and hope escalates our joy. Don't fall for the idea that joy is reserved for happy times when all is well. All is well times are short-lived. Yet in almost every situation, you can find joy. Joy is something deeper than happiness. It's not dependent on present circumstances. When a family buries their loved one, they're not happy. They're grieving their loss. And yet, in nearly every one of the hundreds of memorial services that I've officiated, I've always seen some joy. There is joy in celebrating the life their loved one lived. There's joy in the support and care that individuals give to each other. And there is joy in their faith that this physical life on earth is not all there is. At the Last Supper, Jesus was distressed. He was about to be betrayed and murdered. And yet, he spoke of joy. Joy because his bond with God and his bond with his disciples was so deep and so true and so right. The Apostle Paul was imprisoned in Rome. He wrote a letter to the Philippians shortly before he was murdered. He told them, 
Rejoice in the Lord always. He wasn't happy about his lot, but through his tribulations, he was able to maintain a joyful spirit. How did he do that? Because he believed that there was nothing in life or in death that could separate him from God's love. On Friday night, devastating tornadoes swept through this country, leaving just this path of destruction in their wake. A candle factory in Kentucky was reduced to rubble. A number of people lost their lives. There was a group of women who were trapped in the rubble. And they were not only engulfed by that rubble, they were engulfed in darkness. It was 10 o'clock at night. Women were crying. Women were screaming. They were losing all hope of being rescued. And Kiana Parsons Perez kept telling the women, we're going to be all right. They're going to find us. They're going to dig us out of this mess. We'll be okay. The women kept crying, screaming. She said, listen, folks. In two hours, it's going to be my birthday. I'm going to be 40 years old. So you're going to sing happy birthday to me. And she got them singing happy birthday. It wasn't a mighty fortress is our God, but it still gave them the hope they needed to hang on, and they were all rescued. Albert Einstein said, how many people are trapped in their everyday habits? Part numb, part frightened, part indifferent. To have a better life, we must keep choosing how we will live. In a similar vein, Henry Nouwen said, joy does not simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and we have to choose it every single day. If you are struggling to find joy, here are some practical things you can do. Pick up the phone and call a friend. List five things for which you are grateful. Go outside and just soak in the details of God's creation. Remind yourself, you do not live in Afghanistan. Listen to beautiful music. Even better, sing music that will lift your soul. Two weeks ago, our congregation started singing again for the first time in 20 months. Because of my mask, you did not notice, but on one of those hymns, I got so choked up, I couldn't get the words out. The music and the lyrics touched something deep inside of me, and it just sparked this feeling of joy. I would even dare to say that it helped me become aware of God's spirit flickering within me. If you are anxious or depressed or despairing, there is a simple formula for increasing your joy. Do something for somebody else. One of the reasons that joy has become such an integral part of Christmas is because of the season's emphasis on giving. God has given us God's precious child, and in thanks to God, we give to others. Now, if you give a gift to someone and expect a gift in return, there's only so much joy in that. It's too much like an unspoken contract. I'm going to give you something, and I'm kind of looking for something to come my way too. 
Well, there's definitely joy in affirming our love for each other. However, our joy is so much greater, so much deeper, when we give to someone who doesn't expect it. Bishop Desmond Tutu joked that God must not have a very comprehensive understanding of math. According to the laws of mathematics, if you give something to someone, it should subtract from yourself. But in fact, when you give, you get something back. It increases your joy. If you make a financial contribution to our Christmas boxes or the echo gifts or the uh, Christmas offering, you can do it out of obligation. But it will put a smile on your face and it will put a glow in your soul if you do it in a way that you contemplate the joy that you're going to be giving to someone else, someone you will never meet. It will lift their spirits to know that there are good people who care. And it will lift your spirits to know that you're one of those people. Back in the day of propeller aircraft, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. flew from New York to London. The flight then with those propellers took nine hours. When they were beginning to come back, he was surprised to learn that the trip back was going to take 12 hours. Now, he knew that the distance from New York to London was the same distance as from London to New York. But he was concerned about this discrepancy, and early in the flight, the pilot came through the cabin and was greeting all of the passengers, and he stopped the pilot and said, yeah, explain this difference. Well, the pilot said, well, when we leave New York, the winds are behind us. We have a tailwind, and so we're able to fly much faster. When we return to New York from London, the winds are against us. We have to go through a strong headwind. But, but don't worry, these four big engines on this plane, they will get us through that. They can battle the winds. Reflecting on that experience, King said, at times in our lives, the tailwinds of joy and triumph and fulfillment favor us. And at times, the headwinds of disappointment and suffering and tragedy beat unrelentingly against us. We must decide whether we will allow those winds to overwhelm us or whether we will journey across life's great Atlantic with our inner spiritual engines equipped to go on in spite of the winds. This refusal to be stopped, this determination to go on living in spite of, is the fierce belief that no wind of adversity can blow away our hope. You cannot have hope and remain dismal. Hope paves the way for joy. So keep searching for those crocuses.
siblings in Christ, let us go to God in prayer. Our souls cry out with a joyful shout, for you, O oh God, are great. We can scarcely believe that you, Lord of all time and all creation, became flesh and lived among us. Yet so great is your love for us that you entered into our brokenness. We rejoice that the one in whom your fullness dwells drew near to us as a babe in a manger, that we might know justice and peace and wholeness. During this Advent season, we wait for you to draw near to us again, and we watch for glimpses of your new creation. We watch for the day when nations will beat swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks, when the wolf will live with the lamb, when the desert will rejoice and blossom. We long for the day when weak hands are made strong and feeble knees become firm. For many of us, it is hard to await your coming with hope and joy, for there is so much that defies your vision for creation. In this time of gathering darkness, when day fades quickly into night and the shadows of despair descend upon many, we seek your light in every corner of our world. Send your hope upon those who are weighed down by injustice or weary from grief. Send your peace upon neighborhoods torn by violence and communities embroiled in conflict. Send your joy into hearts that are broken or lonely and your love upon those in need of compassion. Draw near to your children from Kentucky to southern Mexico, who are mourning lives lost to storms or accidents, who know too well the longing for a world made right. Fill them with your comfort, we pray, and fill all of us with your hope, your peace, your joy, and your love that we might bear witness to the one who comes, who is the light of the world. Give us courage to carry Christ's light into the world until sorrow and sighing flee away and every parched place breaks forth in song. We pray trusting that you are the one who wipes away every tear, who comes to set your people free. So with the confidence of your children, we offer the words Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Look for the light, spread the light, and rejoice in the Lord always. And now may love, peace, hope, and joy be yours this day and forever. Amen.